So welcome everyone to Howling Coyote podcast, streaming to you today from Monterey, California, but usually from the University of Maine and Orono. And I'm, I'm privileged today to have as my guest, uh, Siseko Kumalo, who's a lecturer in philosophy at the University of Fort Hare in South Africa. And I, I'm really excited to have him because I came across his work on decolonization, both in general and of, and of universities. And it, it seemed so relevant to what we're trying to accomplish in North America and, and specifically at the University of Maine. And uh, so I thought it would be great to hear what's happening in South Africa and to hear his perspectives and, and to hear his take on indigenous philosophy and, and all of those topics. So um, without further ado, uh, take it away, Siseko. Thank you, Lewis, and uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Um, so maybe let me start off just with a bit of a background in terms of what I do, where I'm situated, and how I came to work with within the space of decolonization and decolonial theory. Um, so I started in university as an undergrad student in 2014, uh, which when we look back on now is not that long ago. Right, it's like yesterday. Um, and what happened is that in 2015, um, South Africa has its first set of must fall movements, um, really. And it begins, of course, at UCT with the act of Kumani Makwele bringing human excrement onto campus and flinging it on the statue of Cecil John Rhodes. Um, on the UCT campus. And, and that, that's a huge moment for us for a number of reasons. The first of which is the contestation of this kind of colonial figure that was perched atop this mountain overlooking the city of Cape Town. And, and basically this kind of legacy, right, of colonial settler identity, colonial settler identity in South Africa. And he challenges that, and this begins to spread all across the country in very interesting ways. Um, but even prior to that particular moment, I was quite concerned by the fact that there was knowledge that I was bringing from my home environment that when I brought into the university context and I had the, pr the privilege and the pleasure of reading in undergrad in anthropology as well. And I loved anthropology because anthropology kind of took the, the knowledge that I was bringing into the university context and took it seriously, engaged with it at a very serious and deep level. Um, and and I, was, I was interested in, in that disjuncture between formal knowledge, formal knowledge as we have it in the university system and as, as it is presented to students and what is considered informal knowledge, knowledge that sits outside of the university. Um, and I was interested in that rift, maybe, if one can call it that, that exists between those two worlds, which is one of the reasons why when I first started thinking then about how to, to bridge that gap, to bridge those fissures, I, I began to think about, well, who is the person who's coming into the modern South African university? What are they thinking about? What knowledge are they bringing into the university? And is that knowledge legitimate, legitimated, validated, and seen? by the university, by the professors, by the lecturers, by the academics? And is there a knowledge system around harnessing that knowledge and using it not in ways that are extractive, but in ways that create co-creation knowledge relationships, if one can call them that, right? And I was, I was fascinated by that. And, and, and as an undergraduate student, I then began to think about these things um, quite deeply and, and, and they spurred me quite a lot in terms of my reading and my understanding and my, my, my pursuits at, at, at graduate level in terms of reading at graduate level. I'm currently concluding my PhD at the moment. And I'm thinking about harnessing knowledge that comes from 19th and 20th century uh, philosophers or intellectuals, black intellectuals who are writing in their indigenous tongue uh, here in South Africa and thinking about using that as a way of modeling an inclusive national identity in South Africa. So 
uh, in the whole, really, just a short sort of idea around who's Sisego, what's he about, and, 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 and how does he come to think through some of the questions of the discussion that we're going to be having here tonight, yeah. Yes, thank you. And um, I read with interest about the Black Archives. You wrote a paper mm -hmm. about, um, um, I, I mean, my interpretation is that sort of resurfacing or recovering or representing or or showcasing um, indigenous philosophers from South Africa, as you said, from 100 to 120 years ago. And um, I thought that was incredible. And I wondered if you could tell us more about who are some of those philosophers and, and what they had to say and what language they said it in and mm -hmm. things like that. Sure. Um, so I'm, I work with two um, indigenous philosophers, and I call them philosophers because of the kind of work that they do. Um, so, and I'm going to use my own home language. In my own home language, we have oracle, you know, the, 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 the artistic form is in the format of oracle, and there are four categories. Um, in, in the sense of there are four forms uh, within that particular space. There is the poem, be it just a basic composition or an epic composition, which is called Ingondlo. We then have Inganeguane, which is a sort of a, a story or a tale that's passed on from one generation to another. Then you have Insumansumane, which is basically a um, fantastical tale, a fantastical story, basically, like a fairy tale of sorts, right? Um, and then you have uh, Indaba, and Indaba is basically a dramatized, um, sort of a, a dramatized historical account or a dramatized story, popular story, as it were. And then you've got a fifth category, which is the representation of history, which is Mlang, right? Um, and what I work with, I work with all of these forms in the work of digging through and working through the Black Archive, specifically because I'm interested in the concept of remembering. And when I say remembering here, I'm talking about re-membering, right? So restitching the histories of our people as our people told our own histories and as we thought about our own histories. And the reason why I mentioned these four forms with the fifth one being history is because within these four forms is contained philosophical method. The rhetorical composition that is used in the relaying in the composition, in the telling of these four forms means that one can either take the form um, as a mode of entertainment Right, so one can either think, oh, this is a lovely story, this is a lovely poem, this is a lovely um, fantastical story, this is a lovely tale, right? One can think of it in those terms, or one can be invited to think more deeply about these forms in the sense of what is it that the form is trying to convey? How is it trying to convey it? Um, sometimes you'll have, for instance, in say, for instance, a praise poem, somebody who does dual work um, and it's veiled under the, the guise of ambiguity, you know, whereby someone will, for instance, be offering, will be seen to be offering praise, but in fact, they're actually offering criticism. And the, the dialogical nature of the form allows for the philosophical work to happen in the sense that the performer will give us, for instance, in Gonjo, which will be when received, dissected, interpreted, and analyzed by the audience who will then apply themselves either to the moral or ethical claim that is being made by the poet in that particular composition. So I call these two colleagues that I'm working with philosophers because they inspire us to think in those terms. They inspire us to ponder what it means um, when, for instance, they're making a particular claim in poetic form or in uh, the form of a dramatized novel, for instance. Um, and I work with these two guys. The one is William Wellington Gropper, and he was writing from 1844 up until his death in 1888. 
And he's an interesting character for me because he has this interface or this kind of intermarriage between the world that was uh, prior to the arrival of 1820 settlers, specifically here in the Eastern Cape uh, of South Africa. Um, so you have the 1820 settlers arriving and William Wellington Gogba is born about 20 years later because he's born in 1840. Um, and what he sees is a world that was and the world that was becoming. So he's in this kind of liminal space and he does a series of epic poems that he pens, one of which is called Inmoto in Kulungem Fundo, a great debate about education. And he poses this, this, poetic, this poetic composition, this epic poem in parable form, where he's asking us the question of which education system is the better one? The one that existed prior to the arrival of the 1820 settlers, or the one that has come with the arrival of the 1820 settlers. And I, 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 I ponder that because of the kind of I, I, insights, I guess, that we get from him. And then the second guy that I'm working with is um, S.E.K. Mkai. And S.E.K. Mkai was very, very interested. He, in fact, inspired Nelson Mandela. The reason why, for instance, at the Rivonia trial, you see Nelson Mandela dressed up in Kosa garb is because of this one particular great literary figure that is S.E.K. Mkai, whom he holds at the back of his mind every single time you know, he engages with the modern political world. Um, and, and he holds on to this kind of, now I'm talking about Nelson Mandela, he holds on to the pride of place of his tradition and custom because of the work of S.E.K. Mkai. Um, and S.E.K. Mkai does an interesting novelette in 1914 titled The Lawsuit of the Twins. And there he gives us a very interesting exposition of Kosa jurisprudence, whereby he thinks about the question of how it is that we come to discern, discuss, and review judicial matters within the Kosa court outside of the sort of customary legal frameworks that we inherit again from the British. Because in an example, for instance, that he pens in 1917, he talks about this distinction that the king, Magoma, makes, for instance, when um, a settler comes to try a case against a slave. And it is reported in that historical account that Magoma says that in, 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 in Kosa land, in, amongst our people, we do not have such a thing called a slave. And so the case will be arbitrated as a matter between two men who have brought a charge against each other. And of course, the matter is, you know, it, it disfavors the, the, the court's ruling, if one can call it like that, the court's ruling disfavors the white man and the white man disregards the court's ruling because he, he, wanted, he wanted the ruling to be, uh, you know, to his favor kind of thing. So, so these are the two characters that I work with, and, and, and th this is the kind of stuff that they're applying themselves to. The one is applying himself to the institution and function of education, the other one is thinking about Kosa jurisprudence, and I seek to think through how their work really begins to give us new insights into contemporary disciplinary formations within the university. And what that then means for the kind of research agenda that we as institutions drive in the service of producing knowledge that attends to the problems of our local communities. Um, and for me, that kind of healing work through knowledge takes place in this kind of excavatory, historical, reconstituting work of remembering in the sense of restitching the the the, the the thinking and, and, and the orientations of those black intellectuals who came before us either in the 19th or the 20th century, yeah. It's really fascinating because, uh, you know, it's, it's a area that, I mean, we know so little, I think, in North America about uh, what has happened and is happening in South Africa. And, and it's a sort of, um, hazard of living in the United States is that um, we ignore the rest of the world. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I get a little news because I listen to uh, 
the news from Paris in the mornings as I exercise. So I know a little bit more than some of my colleagues about the world um, and about Africa, but it's, it's quite fascinating. And, and, and before we started recording, you were talking about uh, bringing the wisdom of 100 to 120 years ago back into the modern world in, and this, this need to decolonize settler colonial capitalism. And I wondered if you could say more about that, including what you said before we went on camera. Yeah, um, and I think it's, that's a very nice segue that you're bringing in there, right? In the sense of the distinction between the, the West and the rest, right? Um, so, so the West, was it, was it not the likes of Hegel, for instance, in his philosophy of history, um, where he kind of makes this claim that Europe is the epicenter of the world and within Europe, Germany is the epicenter of Europe, right? So he kind of, and he says that everybody else who wants to attain development or this level of human consciousness ought to look to Europe and more specifically ought to look to German uh, civilization in order to be able to get ahead. And that was in the time of Hegel. Now, I think what has happened since then is that the world has shifted its gaze and looked to Europe. Um, I'm not to Europe, to, to, the, to, to North America specifically, right? Um, with the cultural hegemony of the United States specifically. Um, and that cultural hegemony is a cultural hegemony that's propped up by capitalism. Um, and what capitalism does between the 19th century and the 21st century is that it advances this highly individuated, self-benefiting kind of model, right? So in order for me to be seen to be successful, I need to earn a particular job, I need to live in a particular community, I need to be you know, carrying particular brands, I need to be shopping in specific spaces, that kind of stuff. And that sense of consumerism is a consumerism that's exported as this kind of cultural, this, this cultural capital, right? In order for, for you to, to, to be recognized in certain spaces, you've got to speak in certain ways, dress in certain ways, wear certain, you know, what is it, a fashion brand, et cetera, et cetera. And what the West is realizing, whether it is indeed in Germany, in the United Kingdom, in Canada, in the United States, is that that way of living is actually highly, highly problematic because it leads to incredible levels of depression. It leads to incredible levels of anxiety and it leads to incredible levels of isolation, really, right? This, this highly, highly individuated society. And in reaching out, what, what I've seen from my own observation, you know, and I haven't, I haven't written anything on this, but what I'm seeing from my own observation is that the West is then turning to the East or to the South um, in looking for ways of reconstituting ourselves. So you have people turning to meditative processes. You've got people turning to, you know, constituting themselves within the realm of community, within the realm of relations that existed and defined society and how society operated prior to this hyper-capitalist orientation, which for me speaks back to the world as it was as early as 120 years ago and even earlier. Now in the South African context, and maybe this is the reason why I work with the characters that I do, we've got an interesting distinction, Lewis, between what we call amagaba, Right, Amagaba basically means it, it came. It came to be associated with those who are illiterate. But Amagaba were people who refused and rejected colonial missionary education because they believed in their own education systems. They knew that their own education systems could attend to a vast multiplicity of social ills, be it illness itself, be it you know socio political organization. It attended to a lot of that stuff. It also had education systems, legal systems, et cetera. And then you had what we call Amagoboga, right? And Amagoboga are seen as the people who acquiesced to, um, what is it, to British 
colonial missionary education uh, or to just colonial missionary education, whether it be it British, German or Dutch. And the fascination for me is the fact that a lot of people today who held the standard of colonial missionary education quite highly and prized it quite a lot are turning back to say, but there are systems of knowledge that existed in our own ways of knowing. And those systems of knowledge still exist by the way, right? Those systems of knowledge, whether I turn to, you know, the local community out here, a couple of kilometers away in Baba or in Mobo or somewhere, I'll find those systems of knowledge still very much alive and still highly informative of the people's lives and how the people constitute their lives. And I bring this up because I say 120 years ago, the life was more communal, life was more attached, etc. But we still have remnants of that because the literature in the 20th century continued to document and discuss the tension that existed between the modernizing world and the world of heathens, as it, as it was known, the world of Amagaba, which rejected missionary colonial education in whatever form it came in. And the problem or, 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 or the reason why, you know, when we were speaking earlier, we were talking about the fact that this knowledge that we have within our local communities has been rejected by capitalism. My own diagnosis of the issue is that it's being rejected because capitalism doesn't know how to monetize that knowledge because that knowledge was never based on this highly individuated monetary system. It was shared knowledge, it was communal knowledge, it attended to sustainable modes of living. If you think about the global climate crisis that we're faced with at the moment, the global climate crisis emerges as a result of the highly consumerist society. And then you have the West saying, but we've got to build sustainable uh, farming practices that will be able to reduce carbon emissions. And those are systems of farming that still exist today. And those are systems of farming that exist under the system of thinking known or reserved for Amagaba, the heathens, right? Now, it doesn't benefit the capitalist system, for instance, the commercial farmer who wants to make millions from a crop to go in that system of crop rotation and um, crop rotation and, um, you know, sort of thinking about how, how to create sustainable practices within their own local communities mm -hmm. or within the farm itself. So it doesn't benefit those people. And so there's, there's an interesting tension in the world at the moment. If you think about consciousness literature in the sense of self-developmental literature that's trying to, the, you know, the work that we, we are seeing more and more of coming out is this idea of rehabilitation, returning to the self. There's a tension between that idea of wanting us to return to the self and also wanting to live this highly consumerist life that is driven by capitalism. And for me, the way in which we can try and bridge that, that tension or try and diffuse rather that tension is to think about how do we tap into our historical and pre-existing knowledge systems in ways that don't seek to make money out of them, but in ways that seek to attend to the world by healing through knowledge production. And, and, and that's where for me, the decolonial aspect meets the intellectual and academic project, which is this idea of trying to heal the world with and through knowledge, which is what our ancestors were doing in any case 150, 200 years ago. They were healing the world through knowledge. It's, it's so relevant, you know, to, to the discussions that are going on for us in Maine, um, you know, because if, if one looks at the university, it's all about individualism, the individual thesis, the, the competition of students with each other for grades, um, the competition for who's, you know, Phi Beta Kappa, who's at the top of the class, the competition for research money, you know, the competition for who has, who has the best knowledge to sell. And, um, you know, it, it, it made me think of something that I think it's relevant here, what you called democratic violence, mm. uh, seems relevant to, to this discussion. Um, 
that that um, that this this work of decolonization um, has it it undermines capitalism because it it can't be monetized in the same way. Yeah. It it's completely, um, you know. I think it was um, maybe it was Malinowski who talked about uh, systems of exchange that cannot be monetized that involve reciprocity mm -hmm. and and social exchange, social relatedness, and mm -hmm. that's you know that's what um, capitalism has has dismissed because it isn't profitable and yet it's what we crave and and you and I were talking a little earlier about the paper that I was presenting at the qualitative research conference which really comes down to people people with mental illness heal through relationship and through embeddedness in a social network and none of those things make money and, and that's one of the conclusions of my paper is that the people that I'm writing about got incredibly healthier and, it, and, and the people who were helping them didn't make a lot of money <laughs> at the, at the mm -hmm. same time. Um, and, and the people who didn't get, I mean, I have a comparison group, who didn't get better and the people who were working with them, I won't say helping them, made a whole lot of money. So, um, so anyway, I, I digress and because we want to hear from you, but can you say more in relation to that and also in relation to, to your concept of democratic violence? And, and, and thank you for bringing up the, the paper because I, I, I don't think actually it's a digression. I think it, 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 it serves as an illustration um, to, to, de to demonstrate the point, right? In the sense that you've got communally based, community situated modes of healing and of relating, which are jettisoned by the people who are pushing pharmaceutical products, right? So people wanna be able to prescribe drugs um, in order to treat people. Uh, whereas in fact, it's not a matter of treatment, actually, it's a matter of suppressing particular emotions or suppressing particular experiences to the extent that you create of a human being a living zombie right? Um, somebody who cannot understand their own environment, somebody who is not attuned with themselves. Um, and I think that that really points to, there's a lovely philosopher here at home, uh, Mahobe Ramose, um, and he's the one actually who gives me this concept of democratic violence. I, I borrow it from his work. And he talks about the concept of money ruling the world, right? Um, he, he, he uses a very interesting concept around it. Um, you know, he, he says that money has become so pivotal to everything that we do that if, for instance, you, you know, attack a vehicle that is carrying, you know, currency, right, uh, cash and transit, um, whether it be a heist or whether it be anything, the first thing that will that the people who are protecting that money will think to do is that they'll shoot to kill you first and ask questions later, right? So mm -hmm. money has become so much more important than human life that the moment that money is threatened, the instinctual response of those who are protecting money is to kill people as opposed to ask questions about, okay, how do we attend to the situation? How do we diffuse the tension and how do we how do we go forward? And, and, and the point that you make there is, is, is very important because the individuated capitalist system, whether it be the jostling for grant and funding subsidies from you know, private donors or the state, whether it be for students, college students who are vying for you know, the prize, the distinguished prize in English literature or the distinguished prize in psychiatry for the best thesis, it's all driven around money. Um, and knowledge has become so commodified and so monetized that it fails at this point in time to do the work of healing. Where people will want promotions and you look at their research portfolio and you look at their research 
outputs and you think to yourself, okay, cool. We're looking, you know, this person is looking for a promotion, but what really have they done substantially enough to contribute to the knowledge domain in order to qualify for this particular thing? But we're now looking at quantity as opposed to quality. We're looking at quantity as opposed to the impact that people that, that people's work is having on people's lives. And when I'm talking about impact, I'm not talking about, you know, the numbers as we've so crudely reduce the game too, in the sense of, you know, how many citations or this, that, or the other thing. I'm talking about the impact in terms of our local communities. And in the South African context, one of the critical things that the university system is trying to grapple with is this notion of what we call um, community engagement, whereby one does not get a promotion, for instance, if they cannot exceptionally demonstrate within their promotional portfolio or their file that they've got substantially rooted community engaging research practices or pedagogical practices, right? Promotions committees now are looking for that component to say, how does the knowledge that you're producing, that you're teaching in a lecture theater seep out into the local community and begin to influence the kinds of ways our communities are thinking about the project of your contribution from whatever disciplinary location you're coming in at. And that's where democratic violence becomes so fundamental and so important because what Ramosa explains it as is that it is a violence that uproots a deeply entrenched and systematic mode of injustice and places in its stead modes of justice that attend and heal the world. And here then there comes the big question, the ethical and the moral dilemma for myself as the philosopher, right? Is, is this mode of violence intellectual and intellectual exercise in the sense of, do we think about this violence and do we only contain it to the written word? If we think back, for instance, to Franz Fanon's chapter two concerning violence, the biggest, the biggest criticism that he gets is by Hannah Arendt Hannah Arendt, who's actually reading, you know, Franz Fanon through Jean-Paul Sartre's preface to the book, um, or forward to be more apt to the book, right? Um, and Hannah Arendt derides this idea of the use of violence because to a certain extent, you find in her a conservative element that says we've got, we've not, we've, we've got to be thinking about these things as academics uh, at a level that respects the kinds of lives that we put in jeopardy when we when we put out these kinds of concepts. And to bring the point home more directly, as opposed to just having a theoretical conversation, the, the concept of democratic violence takes place in South Africa and we see it in action between 2015 and 2017. Institutions are burning down, literally. Institutions are burning down, infrastructure is being set alight, and students are saying the system is against us, the university system, is not doing anything for us, and so we'll torch it to the ground. And what that does is that it creates an incredible sense of instability. And so one of the critical things that I'm thinking about now is when we're thinking through the use of democratic violence, is it a sort of Frarian conception whereby we use education as a radical tool for change, or do we ignite grassroots change whereby we mobilize communities and people and students to take to the streets and to demand their democratic liberties, their democratically enshrined or constitutionally enshrined rights for basic amenities such as water, for instance, clean drinking water that is uncontaminated by the mining explorations that we see from big corporations, that we give children access to quality education that gives them a shot at life. If we think about Amatya Sen's capabilities approach as but one example, where we're thinking about the health systems that we have in place, um, do we organize and do we call for those rights in ways that literally create a shudder within the state apparatus and in the political machine? Or do we think about these things or, and organize around conceptual ideas and you know, 
thinking through the difficulties of our society together in a way that tries to intervene at a policy level, at a parliamentary level, that kind of stuff. And I'm not sure, Lewis, I, 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 I would be lying if I said it's an either or, because at, on, on most occasions, we do the work of organizing at an intellectual level, at policy and so forth and so on, but we never see the, tra the translation of all of that knowledge into the grassroots level. And when the grassroots, when the people on the ground take to the streets, they honestly shatter the comfort and the security of all those who think that they're doing anything of difference in the sense of who, who walk the corridors of power and do nothing really to change the material conditions on the ground for people. Um, but at the same time, those who, who occupy those corridors of power need that wake up call because I think sometimes we can get too comfortable in our secure jobs as intellectuals, as parliamentarians, as policy makers, that we will become disconnected with the realities of the people who don't have clean drinking water, whose kids don't have access to education, whom they and their kids themselves don't have access to quality health care. So, it's a difficult one. It really is a difficult one for me to, to be able to, in a nutshell, say, which way do we go? Do we go with the actual use of violence or do we go with the propositioning of change through the intellectual project? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, here in the United States, there's much talk now about the, the storming of the Capitol last January 6th. And I you know, it's interesting to think about that because the people who stormed the Capitol, I think, believed that those in power um, were, doing, were doing nothing to um, make living conditions better. And, and, and I suspect that's true because of sort of neoliberal capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, and yet the people whom they were supporting were even less likely to improve their living conditions. <laughs> that that uh, you know that sense of what Marx called obfuscation. That that um, that they were because of their perception that no one took their interests seriously. They were actually working against their interests. And mm. and um, I wondered if you could comment on that. And that's the, that's the interesting bit, um, because a lot of us across the globe watched January 6th with bated breath. Um, that was a scene that in terms of the conversation and the ways in which we're thinking about it and the international discourse in terms of media, that was a scene that you would expect, for instance, from Zimbabwe or from South Africa or from Nigeria or from Ghana. You know, the election has gone in a particular kind of way. The sitting president doesn't want to vacate power. There doesn't, there isn't this smooth transition. Kind of that, that's, you know, um, and so you've got a dictator clinging onto power, mobilizing the troops, trying to forestall the smooth transition and the smooth democratic process continuing, right? Um, and I think in, in, in many ways, there are two things, and, and, and I'm, I'm, because I think the conversation, you know, in order for us to, to, to touch on, on, on the many aspects that we can in this conversation. So I'll try to keep my, my, my responses short, but, but as useful as possible. Um, there are two things that come up for me when I'm looking at that scene. I think about the fact that Intellectuals in the system in the United States have constantly and always attempted to theorize and think through the democratic system of the United States um, and how it disenfranchises and empowers certain people, right? Um, but what happens is that there's this rise, in South Africa we saw it with the Zuma years, um, in the United States, I think you guys were very lucky because you guys at least had four years of the Trump administration. You didn't have 10 like us here at home. And in both instances, 
both democratic societies are characterized by misinformation and basically the punting of a particular agenda. Whether that agenda is good or bad, that's neither here nor there for me and you to make a discerning judgment on, right? It's, but, but there's a dis, there's, there's this sort of campaign of disinformation to the extent that South Africa has Bell Pottinger, a, a, a UK-based uh, PR corporation that is feeding and pumping misinformation into the public constantly for about a good decade in this country, which then creates a system that is untenable for the proper functioning of democratic institutions. That disinformation has meant an anti-intellectualism. So when academics are saying, but this is what we're actually finding, this is what our research is saying, you have agencies such as Bell Pottinger that will want to say, well, that's your research. Well, guess what? There's, there's another alternative worldview. Here's our research, right? And that's a, that's a research project that's cooked up in a week or two to counter the 20 odd years of research that a respectable academic has been doing for, I don't know, 20, 25, 30 years, right? Um, and a lot of people then take in the Bell Pottinger message because it's quicker, it's styled in a very bite-sized way. You'll see snippets of it on YouTube as you're scrolling through Instagram. You'll see the stuff on Twitter. For crying out loud, the guy who's sitting in the White House is tweeting and saying that they stole the election. Surely there's got to be something wrong here. Right. But the person who's reading that tweet and saying, well, Trump is saying they stole the election, that person is not thinking about the fact that actually there's democratic process here. Actually, Trump is not interested in serving our interests. Actually, the Trump corporation is drowning in debt. And maybe he's clinging on to power in order to be able to salvage some way of his out of the debt crisis that he's going to be going back into as a private citizen. Right. Um, so, so, so the person who's reading the tweet is not thinking about that. The person who's reading the tweet is not thinking about, for instance, a salient book that came out a year or two ago, theorizing precisely the relationship that big business has with the White House now that one of big business is in the White House, right? Um, they've not read that book and they don't want to read that book because they find that book to be, to be boring, to be arduous, to be convoluted, to be all of these wonderful things. And so what tends to happen is that people then misinterpret, because if we're thinking about democratic violence, it's number one, the proper assessment of an injustice in the sense of we understand the structural, the economic, the political organization of the injustice and how it feeds off of the lives of people. And we then design a system of responding to that structural injustice by way of exercising this democratic principle that is democratic violence, right? Hannah Arendt in Revolution and Freedom in 1966, a lecture, fantastic lecture that she did, you know, says that one of the critical things that has gone undisputed in modern political theory is this idea that the start of something new, the constitution of a new democratic institutional framework is the use of violence, right? She says that this concept has been so passed down from one generation to the other that it's become a non-starter, it's become an unquestioned reality. And she says, is it possible that maybe we're reading the script wrong? And I bring her up because, again, you ask a lot of the people who are involved in that January 6th you know, uh, mayhem, and they'll tell you that we were fighting to preserve our democratic liberties in the United States. We were exercising our rights. We were doing A, B, C, and D in order to achieve this and the other thing, but they're not thinking about the misinformation that's coming out the misinformation that is now, especially under the Trump and Zuma years, Zuma years here in South Africa first and then the Trump years in the state, the misinformation that is then legitimated by government and state apparatus because of the guy who's trying to cling onto power at the top there. And so when, when one thinks about democratic violence, which is one, another reason why I then say, I'm not sure how 
to action the concept of democratic violence in the sense of, do I think about it as the intellectual hermit in my study, composing my own ideas, or do I go to the communities and in the grassroots level and organize? Because what if I'm organizing against something that I've actually completely and utterly misread? Whereas if I was sitting in my study and thinking like a hermit, maybe my ideas wouldn't hurt as many people, you see. Indeed, indeed, that the, the danger is, is responding to misinformation. Mm. Yeah. So before we run out of time, I wanted to talk about um, your paper on developing epistemic impartiality uh, from Social Justice 2021. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could um, say a little bit more about um, this whole notion of decolonizing knowledge without too much relativism. Okay. Um, so that paper is inspired by years of reading. Um, and, and one of the critical people that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking with on that paper, um, and, and I don't make too much mention of his work, but I'm thinking with Alistair McIntyre, Who's Justice, Which Rationality? Um, and in that book, McIntyre, really kind of sets up a framework where he's dealing with the question of which system ought to prevail and why. Um, and the reason why I go to him is because in the first instance, I read him you know, in my formative years, uh, in my formative training at university. So I'm quite familiar with him and I'm quite comfortable with him actually. Um, and secondarily, it's because he's quite well respected in philosophical circles across you know, the Anglophone world in any case, right? So, so one should not be presumptuous to think that you know, he's, he's read everywhere. In the Anglophone world, he, he, he's quite a respectable character. And, and he tackles this question of relativism because he's asking the question of how do I assess another cultural system of thought without ceding my own position and what are the kinds of rules of engagement that need to be established in order for one epistemic system to engage in conversation with another tradition, he calls them traditions, that are completely different from each other, right? Um, because in, 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 in in, 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 in entering into dialogue or conversation without establishing those rules of engagement, the problem that we can have is that I can accuse you or you can accuse me of being rel relativistic, right? Um, and nobody respects relativism quite, you know, within, within academic circles. And I don't know why, really, because if one thinks about it, what really is the problem with relativism <laughs> in any case? People don't respect it and people don't like it. Okay, that's fine. Um, and I'm thinking in order for us to, especially because of the resistance that we often get within institutions and within our departments, in order for us to mount a successful decolonial project, I think there's an aspect of trying to sidestep the relativism objection. Right? Because you're going to have a lot of colleagues who are resistant to change who are going to say to us, no, we're not going to do that because it lowers the standards. No, we're not going to do that because, you know, they're going to give some excuse or the other that rests on this notion of relativism, right? Um, and so I'm trying to stay away from relativism because I'm trying to say there's a legitimate aspect here. There's a legitimate project in decolonizing knowledge and decolonizing knowledge from the vantage point of the indigenous knower, how do we do that in ways that carry all parties forward, right? Because I think decolonization, if we understand it properly and authentically, it seeks to leave no one behind in the sense that it, you know, it, it's not this perverted inversion of power. I always like to use the example of an hourglass where you know, now all the sand is that sand, I'm just turning the hourglass just because, you know, that's what I, and that's not what decolonization is. Decolonization 
is thinking about leveling the playing fields in such a way that all knowledge systems can come together and have this inter-epistemic exchange, this inter-epistemic dialogue uh, and learn from each other. So, so, so that's what I'm thinking through when I'm talking to this question of decolonization or trying to attempt the project of decolonization without too much relativism in the sense of invoking that objection of, of relativism, yeah. And in North America, we've, we've been talking a lot about something that is called two-eyed seeing. And uh, it was a term that was introduced by Albert Marshall, who's a, a member of Eskasoni First Nation in Nova Scotia, Canada. And um, I think it was 2004, a colleague of mine, Willie Ehrman at the University of Saskatchewan wrote a paper about creating ethical space between knowledge systems in which um, both can be valid, you know, mm -hmm. and I think, I think that's what we're about here with decolonization is really not to, to turn around the hourglass, as you say, but, but to level the playing field mm -hmm. to say, and, and to say, I think um, that some kinds of knowledges are more useful for some kinds of problems than others. And that where we need to go is to evaluate on utility and, and not on questions of truth, of absolute truth, but, mm -hmm. but you know, what works. Mm -hmm. And at least in my field, um, you know, these indigenous concepts work better for mental health than the, the biomedical, pharmaceutical industry concepts. And it's not to say that I don't rely on pharmaceuticals from time to time for patients. Though I do believe that if I had a big enough village to plop them into, I wouldn't need to do that. Mm. that because I, I don't, the crucible is cracked. There's holes in it, you know. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm using medications to, to keep people inside a cracked container. Mm. Um, and, um, and of course, there's no way I could prove that without having an uncracked container, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a thought experiment in a, in a sense, though I've seen it, you know, when I was doing psychiatry in the North of Saskatchewan with indigenous people, I saw people become psychotic and get engulfed by their community and recover over some period of months without medication. But what was different about those communities is that they were fly-in communities. Okay. And there, there was no exit unless you had a ticket on an airplane. And the tickets within Saskatchewan were more expensive than the tickets to go to Eastern Canada. You know, you could go to Toronto for $200, but to go into the north of Saskatchewan was $1,000. So it, it, for many people who lived in the north of Saskatchewan, it was a no exit situation. Mm. And, and so that's, that's the only example I can point to of, of having containers that were relatively unbroken. Mm. But, but I wondered if, if, if you could react to that a bit and say more. Well, I think I think th there's for me that the, the the question around absolute truth inspires something that that I I've I've been testing as 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 a provocation as a thought um, and as a problem um, and that's the idea of methodology right um, now we've had a number of phenomenal writers from a number of spaces and a number of different communities contributing to that question of methodology. Linda Tuhiwai Smith's work, for instance, is, is but a you know, formidable example. The work of Walter Mignola, where he talks about decolonial aesthesis, moving away from the aesthetic form into the aesthesis, which is the move prior to the aesthetic form, you know, you go to V.Y. Mudimbe's work, Valentine Mudimbe's work, The Invention of Africa, where he talks about 
um, philosophy and the gnosis of knowledge. Again, taking a step back from the philosophical, you know, kind of empir empiricist, positivist thinking and, and stepping back a bit into that which constitutes the foundational aspects that then would lead to a philosophical proposition, provocation, or problem. Um, and I think what, what, what we're seeing right now, especially with the kinds of problems that we're encountering and the kinds of solutions that are being offered by our societies, is precisely that move, that step back. I think the, 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 the enlightenment period that gave us modernity and in terms of conceptual thinking that gave us modernism, postmodernism, et cetera, et cetera. All of that is, is, is being challenged at the moment, right? In the sense of how, how are we responding to socio-political, socio-economic, psychosocial issues? How are we responding to them? What kinds of, what kinds of, 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 of collective solutions are we bringing to the table? Um, and I, and, I, and I ask myself this question, I have been pondering it to say in, in, the, in, the, in the process, um, and this is maybe a, a question that I would like to actually bring to, to the listenership, um, is that in the process of our decolonizing, how do we establish the methodological tools with which to create this platform of inter-epistemic dialogue? You mentioned something quite beautiful, Lewis, where you talk about the idea of the context and, 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 and certain knowledge being more relevant and certain to addressing certain issues and certain problems. And that's what then leads you to this idea that we're not looking for absolute truth, but rather to fix particular problems as they emerge within our society. How do we get to the point, and I think that's where the, that, quest, that, that paper, that, that paper that you've just mentioned, of mine was, was trying to go. How do we establish a situation or a context whereby we can curate a system that will say to us, indeed, it's not about absolute truth. It's not about the refutation of philosophical arguments or philosophical propositions. It's about finding knowledge that attends to this problem, which might not attend to that problem tomorrow or the problems of yesterday, right? Um, it's about finding knowledge that speaks to this problem, which will be redundant maybe tomorrow uh, or will still be effective. It's not about one upmanship, it's about healing. Now, how do we create the rules of engagement? What is the methodology of doing that? And our systems of thought know how to do that, by the way, through deliberation through conversation, um, through trying and testing information, but not an antagonistic way, in a way that holds all of these propositions in tandem. But how do you bring that system of knowing, that methodology into solving a research problem in psychiatry, in sociology, in political theory, in philosophy? Because I think a lot of our students struggle with that. Some, a student might come with an incredible research problem or an incredible research question, and they would want to pursue that research question with this conversation. But then the higher degrees committee will say, what is your methodology for doing this work? And when the student brings this methodology into the defense of their proposal for that research problem, the research committee higher degrees will say that's you know it's not been proven by the leading scholars in our discipline it's not yet an authenticated legitimated way of seeing so even the gatekeepers are perpetuating the problem as gatekeepers we're perpetuating the problem by asking what a colleague and a very dear friend of mine Sabrina Dovukajeni at Beirut calls nonsensical issues. So, so, so we now, as the gatekeepers, will do the work of sort of closing down the capacity for students to think, 
because it doesn't advance my own citation scores. Um, the leading thinkers within our discipline have not yet you know, approved that method that you're coming with um, to your thesis. And I think that's where the problem is. It's, it's about creating the conditions whereby our disciplines will step out of what Lewis Gordon calls disciplinary decadence and begin to see themselves as man-made disciplines. These are not godlike things that are cast in stone that came down from the heavens. We create our own disciplines and we've got to create the mentality to say we've got to change our disciplines, but that's hard because in me changing a certain discipline, it means I'm endangering so-and-so who holds a professorship and a chair, an endowed chair in this particular discipline. Right. So, so there's a lot at stake that I think is, is attached to this. And I'm thinking to myself, how do we piece by piece begin to break down the system in ways that can attend to what we all want, which is a better, healthier society? It, it, I have a humorous example for you. Um, I applied to the Institutional Review Board at the university. Very to do a project in which there were no subjects. Everyone was a, a researcher. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine how they panicked. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and, and what that is, is, is that it, it, it talks to, you know, De Sousa Santos calls it extractivist knowledge production methodologies, right? Um, extractionist and extractivist whereby if, if we create a system where exactly there are no research participants, everybody's a researcher because we're co-creating knowledge that upsets the system because there has to be people from whom we, the experts, are extracting knowledge and then go away to our laboratories, to our offices, to our spaces, and we create the knowledge. So we, we cannot have a space of co-creative how dare you do that? You know, that, that that's not a system, that's not legitimate research. Is that's what, what you're I was get. told. Yes, that's what I was told. <laughs> you see, so, so, so it's, and I think that that's the thing that we need to change. Right. At some point, we have to change that idea to think about the fact that everybody that we encounter is a knower. If that person didn't know, their world wouldn't go around. They wouldn't know how to feed themselves. They wouldn't know how to get clothed, they wouldn't know how to, to put a roof over their heads. Everybody is a knower. It's just the question of what knowledge, in what context, and for what purpose. Right. This is so true. So we're getting near the end. So is there anything that um, you haven't said that you'd really like to, to finish with? I think I'm, I, I, I just like to leave us all with a question. Um, and, and the question really is a question of method. Um, and, and not obsessive methodology in the sense of, you know, we've seen it before, textbooks and textbooks, volumes and volumes coming out on methodologies of research. I think the methodological question in the decolonial turn needs to take a different approach. It needs to interrogate the ethics of knowledge production, not the ethics that establish the differentials between the subject of the research and the researcher, right? How do we establish through research methodology an ethical relationality yeah, yeah. where the knowledge that we produce attends to the lives of the people about whom we write. I think that's the question I'd like to leave us with. How do we create a system of knowledge production that creates knowledge that attends to the lives of the people about whom we write? That's a fabulous question to end on. So it's been a great conversation. I've really enjoyed it. And I, I hope we'll have more conversations in the future. And. Uh, I'm going to invite you, if you'd like, to attend our two-eyed seeing conference, of course, virtually. I'll send you the coordinates. It's January 28th, 29th, and 30th. And 
the time difference may work against you. But if you're interested in dropping in, I'm going to send you the coordinates so you can feel free to do so. And, and perhaps uh, if this becomes an annual event, we'll be able to have you speak in 2023. And, and if we're successfully funded, maybe we'll be able to bring you to the University of Maine. Who knows? It might actually be easier because I'll be taking up a Harvard fellowship um, in September for the 2022-2023 academic year at Harvard. Well, then so consider might... yourself invited to our 2023 Two-Eyed Seeing Conference in so Bangor, be... Maine, which is only <laughs> only a three-hour and 50-minute drive from the hallowed halls of Harvard. <laughs> So, so I, I'm quite yeah. That, so that would be really, it would be a privilege and an honor. And and thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the conversation, and 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 thank you to everybody who will be tuning in. Um, you know, to listen to these ideas. And I too hope that it's an ongoing conversation that can lead to fruitful collaborative relations. Um, between the two contexts, yes. Indeed, indeed. Thank you so much.